Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. My name is Becca McDowell, and my family has been coming to FaithBridge for about 11 years now. I come from a family of five. I have three brothers and a sister, and my sister is two years older than me, and her name is Patty. I spitefully uh, gave her the title of Perfect Patty uh, when we were children. She always did the right thing. On top of that, Patty was also athletic. Patty was very beautiful. She was the homecoming queen, the cheerleader. She dated the cutest guy uh, in the school who also just so happened to be the football player. Uh, I tried to be those things, but I just, I just wasn't because I was certainly made very, very different from my sister. I think I definitely started to feel envious of her. I, there was a moment in time where that jealousy just burned in me and it was um, during a pep rally. Uh, there were, was a group of guys in the stands with signs about Patty and about how great Patty was. And that was a moment in time where I just was uh, very, very envious and very jealous of, of the life that she was getting to live. I was comparing myself to her really in every area of my life, in my relationships and in, in popularity and beauty and, and thinness and all of those things, and I, I could never measure up. And that just planted in my heart that those seeds of envy and, and jealousy, which also turned into bitterness and anger and, and even grief. Have you ever wished that you had somebody else's life? If you have, say hello to the green-eyed beast that resides deep inside all of our souls called envy. That's what I want to talk about today. You feel it when you see someone who has life better, at least appears to have life better than you have it. <clears throat> and instead of rejoicing over the blessings that are coming to that person, you weep inwardly about it. Envy isn't just, though, wishing for somebody else's life. It's begrudging them for having that life. So it's very complex you don't rejoice with them. You hate the fact that they have those things. And lest you think, well, you know what? This sermon ain't going to be much about me. I don't really envy people too much. Well, let me just remind you of something that Tim Keller mentions, and that is that envy works in reverse as well. If you've ever looked at somebody and said, you know, I wouldn't mind it terribly uh, much if, if that person just fell flat on their face. That's envy in reverse, so it really befalls all of us. Maybe for you it happens when you see somebody who has more stuff than you or greater wealth or possessions. Or maybe for you it happens when you look in the mirror and you say, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? And the mirror says, she is. You, you feel it when you see someone who's more beautiful than you or someone who's shapelier than you or someone who's in better shape th than you or somebody who has more hair than you. Now, let's not be rude, all right? Maybe it happens for you when you see someone <clears throat> who has uh, you know, more talent than you, or you look at their children and you see their children have more uh, athleticism or coordination or social um, astuteness or intelligence than yours. It can come in every flavor you ever imagine. Now, back at the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 4, we'll come to a story about Cain and Abel. They were the first two sons of Adam and Eve. They were brothers. 
Wayne Brower portrays Cain and Abel growing up, playing together in the dirt as brothers do, and climbing trees and building forts and carving their initials in those trees like brothers do. And surely those brothers swam in the river together and climbed out and ran races against the animals and ran races against each other as well because they were, they were brothers and friends and rivals as well. They even worshiped together with their parents, Adam and Eve. As Adam and Eve showed them the way, Adam and Eve had told the boys about how it was back in the good old days in the garden before they had flexed their muscles at God and said, we're gonna do it our way and rebelled against God. Adam and Eve had said, oh yeah, back in the, back in the good old days before we sinned. Actually, God would walk and talk with us every day in the garden. But now he stays a little bit farther away from us. And so we show our worship to him uh, by offering sacrifices. <laughs> sort of like by communicating through smoke signals. They showed their sons, here's how we build our sacrifices. And one day, both Cain and Abel came to bring their worship to God. And they built their altars together and they said their prayers together and perhaps they sang a song or two together and then they lit the fires together and they lifted up their worship to God. And it's at this point that the story gets very interesting. Turn and let's look at it together. Genesis chapter four. If you need a Bible, just wave at one of the ushers that are coming down the aisles right now and they'll be glad to let you borrow one of those Bibles and you can find your way there even if you're brand new and you've never opened a Bible before because Genesis is the very first book in the whole Bible. So just turn it a couple pages and you're there. Chapter 4 and we'll start in verse 2 as I read the story to you. Now, Abel kept flocks, but Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor upon Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. And then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? <clears throat> if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door and it desires to have you, but you must rule over it. In other words, God was saying, Cain, I can see the evil that's lurking in your heart right now and you have a choice. Don't do it, Cain. But he did do it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were out in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, where's your brother Abel? He replied, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? You might want to flag that question because we're going to come back to that one in a few minutes. The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you're under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it'll no longer yield its crops for you. You'll be a restless wanderer on the earth. Now, I've always wondered, what was it that this made the, the two offerings that they made to the Lord so different? We're not told exactly. <clears throat> And I agree with most theologians who suggest, well, it probably was not the quantity of what they brought, but the quality of what they brought before the Lord. And furthermore, the quality of their hearts as they were making their offerings to God. But whatever it was exactly, Cain knew there was a difference, and he didn't deal with it well. Now at this point in the story, many of you would probably say, well, you know, this is interesting and all, but I would never haul off and murder somebody because I felt envious of them. No, you, you, you probably wouldn't do that. But has it ever occurred to you, you, you could murder somebody's reputation 
and their heart and their pulse keep beating. You could murder their character and their brain waves are still working. You could murder their confidence and they're still alive. Oh, we can do a lot of murdering. You and I can if we don't deal with this thing called envy inside of us. The Bible says you gotta deal with it. You have to deal with it. It's a cancer that gets in our soul and it's a horribly destructive one. You gotta deal with it for at least two reasons. I'll tell you there are two reasons. First reason is, if you're taking notes, it's because it'll possess you. Envy will just absolutely possess you if you don't watch it. You remember the story of Mozart and his life that was told from the perspective of Antonio Salieri? And the play, the play and the film were both called Amadeus about 20 years ago. And Salieri was the court musician in Vienna. And he had the right to be. He'd worked hard at his trait, his craft, writing beautiful melodies and choral pieces that were lovely and instrumental works that were good. And he had this heart Salieri did for God. He loved God and he worshiped God. And he wanted his music to be an offering to, to God and to his glory. In fact, he prayed, Lord, just use my music to lift people up close to you, that my m songs would actually lift their hearts hearts to heaven. <clears throat> Salieri prayed. And he did the best that he could. And then came young Mozart, the boy wonder, the child prodigy who dazzled the crowds by playing music like it was just second nature to him. And his fingers dancing on the keyboards, playing melodies that were complex and fun at the same time. It just all seemed to come so naturally to him and it just brought heaven right down to the people's ears as they were listening. But Mo Mozart was such an obvious sinner he was vulgar, he was obscene, he was immature, he was a womanizer, and it just chagrined Salieri that he could have it so easy, especially in the light of the fact he was such a sinful person and he tried to become, be always, Salieri had such a devout person. He was green with envy. He, after all, he was the one who was supposed to be getting what Mozart was getting. Salieri had lived that pious, obedient life. Salieri, the one who'd spent his life working hard at his craft. Why should it come so easily? So the story goes, until Mozart died a mysterious death. And at that final scene of the film, if you saw it, there sits Salieri, his eyes gleaming at Mozart's death. He sits there cursing God for denying him the kind of talent that he had blessed Mozart with. And where does he sit? He sits in the insane asylum. It's a horrible story. It's tragic, but it illustrates how envy can absolutely possess you if you don't deal with it. Second reason you gotta deal with it is because it will depress you. It'll depress you. See, envy doesn't work the same way that most other sins do. You think about sloth or laziness. The thing about sloth or laziness is actually they can be kind of pleasurable, at least for a while. They can be, eh, you know, it's not so bad, right? <clears throat> or giving in to anger to giving an outburst of, of, of anger, a moment of rage, there's chemical endorphins that are released from your brain that cause a high in that moment. Don't last, and you'll come crashing. But in the moment, it, it's kind of pleasurable. Same with pride, same with lust, same with greed. Those sins can be pleasurable. Not in the long run, they can't, but in the short run, for a few minutes at least, they can be as you massage those thoughts in your soul. But envy, it's different than all of them. It's never pleasurable. It's a lose, lose, lose from the word 
go. It's no fun at all, ever. It begins to drain joy from your soul the moment you feel it. It poisons your ability to live your life. Tim Keller points out, again, that envy could be uh, called something like comparisonitis. It's not a horrible thing to compare, but envy is like comparison on steroids. Here's how you know it has you in its grip, because nothing's good enough. Nothing's good enough in your life. Your job isn't good enough. Your body isn't good enough. Your friendships aren't good enough. Your marriage isn't good enough. Your life isn't good enough. Nothing's good enough. You're, not, you're just not able to, to enjoy the, the moments of today as you're in today. You can't savor the moments and enjoy them. Why? Because you're always busy comparing yourself to whatever he or she or they have or the life that they're living. It literally poisons us psychologically and socially. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what profession you are. For example, if you're a teacher, I bet you've felt this before. If ever there was a teacher across the hall whose, whose kids, um, where, where the parents sought out that teacher, we really hope that our kid will get that teacher, not this teacher, that teacher. I bet you've felt that before. You know? Or if you're in some sort of business and somebody else gets a promotion ahead of you, or they get the raise that you thought you were supposed to get. Or they get to move offices to a, to a physical space that you thought that, that was supposed to be my office. And every time you walk by, I was supposed to sit. <laughs> Say hello to envy. Or if you're an athlete, perhaps you've felt that if you see somebody who, and he's more athletic, or she's more athletic, or they have more trophies, or more awards, it, can, it, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what your profession you are. If you're a preacher, oh, it can affect you too. I remember <clears throat> 16 years ago, I moved here to start this church. I was 32. And uh, throughout my 20s, I had gone to Vanderbilt University and graduated there, gone on to seminary earned a master's, gone to seminary again, earned a doctorate. And I had really become, uh, you know, I had a lot of preaching invitations here and there and everywhere. And, and uh, I just, my personality and my identity became sort of interwoven with, with preaching. I just thought, well, this is what God made me to do. And I'd speak at this camp and this and deal all around. And even at the Woodlands, at the church that I had served for five years as an associate pastor, when he'd let me go for three or four weeks and do a series, the, the crowd would grow by several hundred people. And so I just figured, well, this is just how it's supposed to be. So when I moved here to start Faith Bridge um, 16 years ago, I figured, well, we're going to build this church on my preaching. It's just the way it is, and I'm ready for the, you know, the shoulder of the burden. Here we go, Lord, and let's do it. And within just several months, God brought me a young man to be my youth pastor whose name is Ben Stewart. <laughs> Perhaps you've heard of him. And... <clears throat> And he had never been to seminary. He'd only been out of college for about two or three weeks. And <clears throat> he'd, never, he'd never had a job. And <clears throat> so I remember several months into starting the church, I said, would you like to try to preach for the whole congregation? And he said, yeah, I'd like to try. And I said, okay. And put him up. And it was good. <laughs> and I said, Ben. That was amazing. I think maybe God has put a gift inside of you. And so several months later, I put him up again. I said, like, can he do it again? And, and he got up and he did it again. I was genuinely excited. I was like, Ben, this is incredible. You have a gift of preaching God has put inside of you. And I was genuinely proud and excited, felt sort of like a big brother or, or, or a dad who, who gets to watch his son throw a, f a first touchdown pass. I, I was genuinely thrilled by what I was getting to watch. Till about a year or so later. <laughs> and then I noticed something. I noticed that people were coming into the first service, to the early service, to hear me preach. 
And then they would go out of the room of the school that we used to meet in, and they would go down to the room where the youth ministry met, and they would stand on the, on the perimeter of the room, these moms and dads would, would listening so they could hear Ben preach. And I remember observing that and hearing them come out and say, well, that was really good. And, and I was thinking to myself, you didn't need a second sermon today. <laughs> you, why are you doing that to yourself? You already heard a great one, you know? And <laughs> Shoo, get out of here. That's a youth service. It's not for old people like you anyhow. <laughs> and I noticed something began to happen in my soul. This part of the story I haven't, I haven't never told. Well, it's time I do. I remember feeling sort of depressed because I was having a bit of an identity crisis. I thought, wait a second, God, you're not running the play that we were going to run. You know, I know who I am and what I'm supposed to do and I'm supposed to preach and the church is supposed to grow and that's the deal. And, and everybody, goes, what's the deal? Why is this happening? And <clears throat> I remember one night in particular, I was sitting in my third floor apartment, staring out the window in the dark. And in my heart and in my mind, I began to wonder, how could I gracefully help him move on? <laughs> gracefully. <laughs> and in that moment, God met me. And he brought to my mind the story. You remember in the Old Testament where King Saul is realizing that God's hand of blessing and favor are upon young David, the shepherd boy, who will become his successor and become the eventual king. And at one scene uh, in that story, Saul is so overcome with, with, with envy and rage that he picks up a spear while David is playing his harp to make beautiful music for the king. And he throws that spear at King David, but he misses. But his feelings were out in the open, never to be hidden again. And the Lord brought that scene to my mind and I felt like the Lord said to me, are you going to be like King Saul? And are you going to throw spears at young Ben? Or are you going to play the role that I've created for you to play in his life? To be an encourager and a mentor and a coach and a confidant and like a father or like a big brother to him as he comes into who God's created him to be and I wrestled I confess that night I wrestled really hard with it and I suppose in his graciousness God saw that I was wrestling so hard and I sensed the Lord say to me because if you choose wrong I can just lift my hand of favor right off a of faith bridge the same way that I did with King Saul, and that's what broke me. And I humbled myself and I repented and I said, yes, Lord, I will play the role that you've called me to play. Little did I know, that would be the beginning of a transformation, sort of a, a redefining uh, of me that over the coming years would become more and more exciting and fulfilling to my life because when I came here, I thought, well, isn't the object of the game is I'm supposed to grow as much fruit for the kingdom on my tree. Now I understand, no, 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 the vision that God created me for was to grow fruit on other people's trees. And it's really a liberating thing when you figure out what God is doing in you and through you. And just so that I can close the loop, so, uh, it, it just, so you needn't worry, although I don't think, <laughs> I don't think any of you do who've been here for any while. <clears throat> ben and I are the dearest of friends and confidants and uh, encouragers, and uh, I count him really as one of my most 
uh, trustworthy partners in the gospel. And we carry a host of happy memories, including the day that he and Donna asked me to officiate at their wedding 10 years ago. And um, so it is truly a joy uh, when I get to watch him spread his wings and just do what God created him to do so breathtakingly. Which, let me just mention, if you're new here and you're like, who is this person he's talking about? <laughs> you should come back next Sunday. All right? Because in the next three, because he'll be uh, uh, bringing the next three uh, messages for us the next three weeks. And you'll get to hear him use that preaching gift that, he's put, it, it, that God has put into him. Now, at this point, I want to come around the corner and say, okay, what do we do about it? Okay? Because I have a feeling any of you at this point are like, yeah, you know, I've got some of that in me too. But what do we do about it? And you can certainly send any questions or thoughts or reactions that you have into the number that they put up on the screen. And, and we'll talk about it in the postscript afterwards. But I want to give you a few things for right now. And a few things that you can discuss in your grow groups as you meet this week or the next week. And you, and you talk about what we've talked about here in your grow groups. Three things if you're taking notes. The first thing is this. You've got to confess it. Okay? And, and sort of wrapped up into that one word, confess. You've got to own it, acknowledge it, realize it's real. See, that envy is a tricky sin because it's very easy for us to, to um, deny that we have envy and to project blame on somebody else. Oh, well, you know, it's all about him. and this. Like, that's, that's envy that's going on. It's not about him. It's about what's in your soul. You've got to name it. You gotta own it. You gotta confess it. I'm wrapping all that into to one thing. Oh, that Cain had just owned the feelings that he was having and just said to God, Yes, I am envious. I am angry. And that he had repented and humbled himself and found that God is gracious and said, Well, then why don't we do this again? Why don't you go out and get another offering and, and let's do this one for real and get your heart into it? The story could have ended so much more happily. So you'll never make any progress if you stay in denial. That's the first thing. You've got to confess it. And then the second thing, you've got to become your brother's keeper. You've got to become your brother's keeper. You remember how God says, so where's your brother? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes was the answer. Yes, you are your brother's keeper, Cain. Now, you say, okay, so how do I become a brother's keeper or a sister's keeper? How do I do that? I'm mean, going to give you three or four things inside the three that I'm giving you right here, okay, if you're taking notes. I want to show you a verse in Luke chapter 6. I think it's a helpful verse. Luke chapter, 26, uh, uh, chapter 6, verse 26 and 27. Okay, now in this passage, Jesus is not talking about envy. He's talking about your enemies, Okay, but he's going to say, here's how you respond to your enemies. I think what you're going to find, though, is that the counsel, if it's good enough for how to handle your enemies, it's good enough for you to handle, to, to use when you're trying to handle those that you envy, who may not be your enemies. They may be your brother and your sister, your relatives, co-workers. But I'm telling you, this, this counsel, it, it's good enough to help you with your enemies, and it's good enough to help you with those you envy. Look at uh, Luke 6, starting in verse 26. Jesus says, but you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Or, yes, and pray for those who mistreat you. Now, I want to take those four things, and I want to take them in reverse order. Let's start with the first one. Pray. What do you do with the person that you're envying? You start by praying for them. I don't want to pray for them. Well, <laughs> you just pray for them. I'm telling you, something will begin to happen. And I'm not saying pray, oh, Lord, why don't you just humble him? You know, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's not the prayer either. 
Now you're genuinely play, praying, Lord, won't you pour out blessings on his life, on her life, on their life? Won't you show them favor? Won't you prosper them? Won't you be good to them, Lord? And if they don't know you, won't you help them to connect the dots back to you and realize that your hand of favor is upon them? And you're praying blessings on you, on them. And you don't just do it once and say, there, I got that out of, no, no, no. You're coming back to it. You put it on your daily prayer list. You put it in your prayer journal for your daily devotional times. And you start praying for that person. I'm telling you, you start praying for somebody every single day and your heart will begin to grow softer towards that person. First thing, pray for them. The second thing, speak well of them. Bless them. Okay? The temptation when we're feeling envy is to speak wickedly about another, especially if their name comes up in a circle and you have an opportunity to kind of wham, you know? (laughs) That's a temptation, isn't it? No, 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 we're not going to do that. Because we're praying for them and we're going to bless them. And we're going to call out something good about their life and, and, and steer a conversation uh, in the positive direction. Yeah, but you know what? He can sure do this well. Or she can sure do that well. Or they sure do this in a, in a wonderful way. Isn't that neat? And you speak blessing. That's what the word blessing means, to speak well. And so you're speaking well over somebody. And then, so you're praying for them. You're, you're saying blessings about them, and then do good to them. You're going to find, if you'll take this progression, there's a softening that has happened in your soul, and you'll actually want to do good to them. Like what? I don't know. Send them a text. Send them a note. Send them a gift. Do a favor for them. Run an errand for them. Do something. And you're going to find that this transformation is happening. You're praying for them. You're blessing them. You're doing good for them. And here's the last thing. You're, start, you're going to start to love them. And you'll actually, and this is the, the most wonderful thing, when you start to love the person that you are envying. And if ill befalls them, you genuinely cringe. You genuinely feel sad. You genuinely feel that. There's a transformation that's happened in you. So this is a great verse. You take those in order, praying for them, speaking well of them, doing good for them, and then love comes. It, it would, you, there will be a, trans, a melting in your heart, and you will find, I actually love them, which shouldn't surprise us. You remember what Paul said about love in 1 Corinthians 13. Half of you had that read at your, at your weddings. You might not remember what he said. Among the other things, when he's talking about love, he says, love does not Envy. How about that? And so a mother can't envy the achievements of the daughter that she loves. A husband can't envy the successes of a wife that he loves. A child can't envy the abilities of his friend that he loves. King Saul, he hated David. He despised him. He was green with envy over David. But his son, you remember his son, Jonathan? He didn't feel that way at all. Even though David was going to bump him out of the kingly succession and David would move in and it would not go to, to Saul's son, Jonathan, because, he, uh, because David was going to move in. But he and David, they loved each other as brothers and friends. And he was genuinely for David. It's a touching story. The beast within is tamed by love. That's what we got to get to. So become your brother's keeper. All right? In the big points, I was saying three things we're going to do. We've got to confess it. We're going to become our brother's keeper, the way we just talked about. And the last thing, check your focus. You need to get your eyes back on God. See, the problem with envy is you're looking horizontally. You're looking at this person and that person or those people. You're not looking at the Lord, the giver of life, the savior of your soul. See, and <clears throat> the, the, the way envy works, it's 
our hearts are like a compass, and our hearts are always looking for true north. They're, they're, they're wanting to lock on something, and they're looking for true north. And when we're embroiled in envy, our hearts are just spinning around, and they're locking on the wrong thing. And, and we can't figure out, why am I not happy? Well, here's why you're not happy. Your compass needle isn't locked on true north. It's settled for this. And you're comparing yourself to what he has or she has or they have. Or, and, and that's why you're not happy. That's why you're not fulfilled. Get your, check your focus. You've got to go back to God who gave you life and who saves our lives. Otherwise, you're going to be looking for, each, for other people's approvals and for measuring and how do I compare and all this kind of stuff. And your, your heart's just going to be that spinning compass locking in on the wrong things. Only Christ, Jesus Christ alone is our true north. So you have to fix your heart and your minds and your eyes on him. And as you do, and as you feel his love flowing into your heart, you'll discover something. You'll discover, what more could I want? What more could I need? The very creator of this whole universe loves me. I couldn't do better than that. And, and there's some element of freedom that comes in this discovery. And let's admit it, there's some element of sovereignty in this whole thing as well. And by that, by sovereignty, I'm, I'm not meaning to say, so therefore don't get up and try your hardest to be your best every day. No, you should get up and try your hardest and be the best every day. But what it is to say is this, if your name is Salieri, you'll never be Mozart because in God's great plan, he already had one of them. He wants one of you to live the life that he's called you to live for his glory. So trust him because he's good. He doesn't make mistakes. But we do. And that's the problem. The Bible says it clearly. All of us have sinned and all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. And, and I'm sure that it could have been tempting for God when he looked into the heart of Cain way back at the very beginning to have just slammed the book closed and say, you know what, this story, it's only up to chapter four in Genesis and it's already taken a dreadful turn. I just, I'm gonna close this up and start over with some new people. But he didn't do that. Or a little further on, by the time of King Saul, I'm sure when he looked in the, the heart of King Saul, he could have been tempted to, you know what, I've really let this story go on long enough. I'm closing this up, and I'm going to banish those people to damnation, and I'm going to go off to another galaxy and start a new world with some new people who get it. But he didn't do that. I'm sure bringing it forward all the way to us, he could have looked into any of our hearts and said the same but he didn't, he didn't say I'm out of here. He said I'm gonna come towards you because I love you. You are a mess, your hearts are a mess, but you'll never fix yourself. So I'm gonna come to that planet Earth. And he packed himself in the flesh and blood of Jesus. And he came and lived the life of perfection that none of us have ever lived, that none of us could ever live. A sinless, perfect life. But that's not all. Although that would have been wonderful and a great example for us that we could have never obtained. <clears throat> After that, he said, now I'm gonna go and I'm gonna die the death of suffering and consequence that you deserve to die because all of you have sinned. All of you have fallen short. All of you have been plagued with this cancer of envy deep in your souls. And so I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to pay the price for you. I'm going to die in your place. And I'm going to go to hell for you. And then the third thing, I'm going to rise. And I'm going to triumph over the grave. And as I triumph over the grave, I'm going to help you to realize that you who are linked to me by faith will likewise have life. 
So check your focus. If you feel that green-eyed monster within envy starting to rear its ugly head, check your focus. Confess it. But then become your brother's, your neighbor's keeper. And check your focus. I bet you need to look back at him. Because when you do, that changes everything. Let Becca tell the rest of her story. It became bigger than just me and Patty. It became a part of my life. I began to compare my, myself, my situation, my circumstances with, with those of people around me in, my, in the circles that I, I've been in. When we got to Faith Bridge about 11 years ago, uh, David and I were in the world. I think it, it was a record. It was the smallest ever Faith Bridge 101. There were three people in it. And I guess uh, Ken must have recognized that I was kind of a spiritual mess. And um, he actually hooked me up with a woman who eventually became my mentor and is still a very dear friend to me. She just kind of worked with me and started pouring into me and teaching me about who I am in Christ. What she helped me to understand was that I was not, I am not, defined by um, what other people think about me. I'm not defined by the way I look. I'm not defined by um, the level of success of my children or my husband. I'm not defined by how many friends I have. Um, my identity, my true identity is in Christ. And when that truth penetrated not just my mind, but my heart as well, when I truly understood what that meant, that gave me um, great peace. And that really is when I, I stopped the comparison game. And that is what my prayer is for my children and for the, the young women I work with. Using the, the places in my heart that were hurt and, and using them for God's, God's glory and hopefully the good of, of those that I get to disciple. Just remember who you are and remember whose you are rather than what you think you need to be or what this world is telling you you should be. It's really about who God says you are. Amen to that. Let's pray together. Lord, in this week of Thanksgiving, what a perfect opportunity for us to do some evaluating. Some evaluating what's going on in our own souls. Forgive us, Lord, because every one of us has given into this sin of envy here and there. Some of us came in even today in the throes of it. But Lord, you offer something so much better. You offer us you. That you would love us so much to come to this earth and die for us and rise for us that we could have life by attaching ourselves to you, not to other people, not to what they think, not to what they have, not to the comparing that is so uh, instinctive for all of us, but that we could have a relationship with the very God of the universe who became personal. My prayer, Lord, today is first of all for those hearing my voice, who maybe they've never come into a relationship with you in the first place. They have never really stepped across that threshold of, of just saying, Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my heart. I need you to be my savior. Not just all those other people's savior, but I need a savior. I need a forgiver. I need someone to transform my life. In the quietness of this moment, I just invite you right now in this moment of prayer, why don't you just tell him that yourself? You just talk to him in your own words silently right now.
And then, Lord, there's others of us who we've crossed that initial threshold of faith. For some of us, it was 10 or 20 or 30 or more years ago that we crossed that initial threshold, but we need to cross it again and again and again every single day because it's so easy for us to to set aside the grandeur and the glory of your goodness and the gospel and to sort of say, well, yeah, that's a nice thing, but now it's about this. I need to get back to this. I need to make more. I need to get more. I need to be more like him. I need to be more like her. Oh, God, forgive us. Won't you help us come back, refocus, put you back in the forefront of our minds. Live for you, for your glory. Live the life that you've given to us, each of us. Not trying to live somebody else's life, which is a surefire formula for misery. Won't you help each of us, Lord, to align ourselves and realign ourselves with you. Thanks for your love. Thanks for your grace. Thanks for your goodness. Thanks that you're good and that we can trust you. Help us to trust you, Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Postscript from Faithbridge Church. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the message by sitting down with the teacher of the day. Welcome to another edition of Postscript. My name is Michael Sullivan and I'm the Young Adults Coordinator here at Faithbridge. I'm joined by Pastor Ken who just closed out our series on wisdom with a great sermon on envy. Uh, thanks for joining us, Pastor Ken. Sure. I was wondering if you could help us distinguish maybe between jealousy and envy. I sure. think normally we use those terms synonymously. Right. Yeah. yeah, and it's a, it's a commonly made mistake. Jealousy is like you reading God's word about how God was jealous for the love of his people. Mm -hmm. So I would be jealous for the love of my wife, Suzanne, and her fidelity. Mm. No sin in that. Uh, the, the sin comes w when one does not get what one was jealous for in their response, because mm. out of that can come anger and wrath and bitterness and certainly envy. Mm -hmm. Envy is what we typically are meaning when we say jealousy. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm jealous that he has that and that I don't. Well, no, 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 you're not. That, what you really are is envious. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's because envy is, it, it's just a word that sounds a little worse than jealousy. Mm -hmm. Maybe that, maybe it's <laughs> not just out of ignorance, but maybe there's something to the fact that we'd rather say I'm jealous than I'm envious. Mm -hmm. uh, because as one of the sources I was reading talked about, envy is a very embarrassing sin to admit mm -hmm. because it's pretty low yeah <laughs> and sure yeah well today you talked about really th three steps I guess confession being your brother's keeper and then refocusing on God is there what is the most difficult part of the process of I guess healing from envy sure well starting probably getting past denial and realizing when we're saying things like, well, if I had as much money as he had, then I could do this. Mm -hmm. Or if I had her, you know, figure, or if I had her, you know, hair or whatever, stopping there mm -hmm. and arresting it and saying, no, no, it's not, it's not about him. It's not about her. It's about you. Right. And probably that's the hardest part is just getting to, to where we cat, catch it and confess it mm -hmm. and own it. And then when we move to being our brother's keeper, the, the several things that, that I mentioned from that passage in Luke 6, mm -hmm. perhaps the, the hardest one there, again, is the first, starting praying, mm -hmm. to say, I'm going to pray for him. I'm going to pray for her. Right. And I'm not going to pray mean things. I'm going to pray blessing things. And I'm not just going to do it once. Keep doing I'm going to pray it daily. Mm. Day after day, week after week, month after month. And, but I'm telling you, 
there is nothing that softens the heart like when you pray for a person mm. and then you speak well of them and then you do good for them and then you find out I actually love them I love her and I I something's changed well yeah so I guess in a word the hardest thing is starting mm. this is not an easy thing to do this dealing with envy is there anything that would be supplemental or somebody could benefit from oh, in sure. going through this process well community mm. so you you know in the testimony that that we shared of, of Becca's life uh, what was one of the key turning points in her story it's when she began to get mentored mm -hmm. by the the good friend dear friend mentor lady that she mentioned mm -hmm. and there's nothing like community mm -hmm. to have somebody who you know loves you so you can get past that I know I'm loved by you but then they can get to speaking truth and there's mm -hmm. And we have to have someone who can do that to us and, and with us and speak truth to us in love and open God's word and say, now look here, this is what the Bible says about you. Right. And we've got to get this going in your heart um, instead of w what you're gauging your life by or what you're trying to find your compass needle fixating on. Uh, so there's nothing like community. How do you get into that? Well. It's hard to get, you know, a, a mentor or a discipler just like that. Mm -hmm. In the instance that she mentioned, I, I actually had a, a lady's name in mind, and it just that just worked. But I think most commonly it happens by getting into a grow group mm -hmm. here at Faith Bridge, crossing the line and saying, "I'm going to get in a grow group." And what you find in a grow group is that you have <clears throat> 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 13, 17 people who are in the grow group. And you have a leader. And you begin to, to make some friends. And you begin to have some people who know you and um, who pray for you. And you're praying for them and mm -hmm. encouraging them. And you're doing life together. And oftentimes, it's in that setting, you find yourself particularly clicking with a person uh, we always encourage same gender mm -hmm. person. Uh, you really need that for a discipleship relationship to happen uh, appropriately. And you find a brother or you find a sister that you click with very well, or maybe two. And you sort of, you, you keep meeting in the grow group, but then you, you, you schedule a supplementary meeting, mm. which that's really where we move into discipleship. Mm. Um, and so I would say that would be the other resource that we have at our disposal sure. um, that I didn't mention in the in the sermon today, but it, which is certainly mention worthy. Well, I think that's really helpful, and, and the talk was very helpful as well. So thank you, Good. Pastor Ken. Mm -hmm. And be sure to join us back next week as we'll be back for another Postscript. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org forward slash postscript.